This videotaping is being done as part of the 10th anniversary celebration of Concordia Lutheran Seminary. It was felt that um, for the sake of the historical record, it would be useful to have some discussion uh, regarding the beginnings of the seminary on the part of those who constituted the first faculty. And this was uh, Dr. Ted Janzo as president, uh, Dr. Ronald Ball as academic dean, and myself, uh, Dr. Trinan, as uh, dean of student life. And we've asked uh, Dr. Rudnick, who is the second president of uh, the seminary, to do the interview and to guide the process. And so we turn it over to him. Thank you. I'd like to ask each of you to think back to where you were and what you were doing when you first heard about the proposed Concordia Lutheran Seminary and when you were first asked to consider being part of this. Where were you, your first word that you heard about the seminary and your possibility of being part of it? Dr. Jensen. Well, I, uh, I was completing my uh, work at Concordia College or Concordia Teachers College in Seward, Nebraska, uh, after uh, almost 25 years on the faculty and staff, and I had served as president of the college for 14 years. And I had begun to process uh, my retirement. And I had uh, announced and obtained approval to retire uh, from the faculty and staff there as of December. 31st, 1983, and uh, I was uh, still serving at that time as a, uh, an instructor and also the director of college relations, and as director of college relations, we had a local radio program, and we taped it on a weekly basis, and I was in the media center with one of our professors, uh, and uh, getting ready to interview half-hour program that would be aired on this radio station. And uh, before we began, the telephone rang, and uh, I happened to be in that same room, and I answered it. And the voice on the other end was Dr. Hyatt, who was uh, at that time the executive secretary of the Board for Higher Education. And he indicated that the Board for Higher Education of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod had met the previous day and that they had uh, decided that they were going to invite me to come to Canada and uh, to begin to organize the new seminary which the church here in Canada had decided to establish in Edmonton, Alberta. This was out of the blue? Out of the blue totally 100% out of the blue with no possible indication in advance that nope. this kind of thing would happen, right? Mm -hmm. did, did you know anything about the seminary being proposed at all? Yes, I did. So you knew I, it was in the wind. I, I had been here in Canada at a, a Pastor Western Canada Church Workers Conference in the, uh, what is it called, the Valley? Okanagan, Okanagan Valley, and I had been the chief essayist uh, at a three-day conference, and there I had been apprised of uh, all of the developments and the hopes, the dreams that, uh, that uh, were there in the church at that time, both for a future Lutheran Church Canada and also uh, for uh, some prospective expansion of the seminary program. But you didn't necessarily see yourself as part of that. I, at that point, of course, they, they had not yet decided that there would be a seminary at Edmonton. That came later. Sure. So, and, and between that time and when this telephone call came, I had, had no communication at all about this. Dr. Process. Ball, what about you? Where were you when you first heard about this and heard about the possibility of your being here? Well, as I recall, I was uh, walking uh, on the sidewalk front of the main administration book of uh, building of Concordia Seward. I was on my way to uh, teach a class. I had books under my arms and as I walked along the sidewalk I uh, 
past Dr. Jan's ode. It was not an unusual thing to happen. And uh, I simply said hi, and he said hi, and I continued on the way to class. And uh, I'd gone on a few steps when I heard, Ron! And he said, uh, come back here. And uh, he said, how would you like to go to Canada and be a part of a very exciting adventure? What was your most recent ministry prior to this? I had been uh, in Hong Kong for a year and had served uh, with my wife uh, as educational missionaries to the Lutheran Church Hong Kong Synod. And, you just come, and I had just come back, yes. I had just been back uh, uh, less than a few months when he asked me uh, to go. And uh, in the coming hours and coming days, uh, if you know Dr. Jamsel when it comes to the gospel, he's an incredible salesman <laughs> in the best sense of the word. And so uh, uh, we, sat, uh, we sat down uh, home with him and discussed it and uh, the eventual decision, we prayed about it, uh, was uh, yes, we ought to do this. But the original invitation uh, blew the socks off. <laughs> I had no uh, indication. So I went to the Board of uh, Regents who had just given me uh, a sabbatical leave and then had allowed me to go over to Hong Kong a second time to do some, some work. Uh, I went to them with another request uh, to be relieved from my ministry to do, in, at Concordia Teachers College in Seward uh, to join Dr. Dick Jansen. And I must say that the Board of Regents at Concordia Seward saw the missionary vision of uh, that call and was more than gracious in their willingness for me to do this task. Dr. Trailer, you were in a somewhat different situation, I think. Uh, tell me what you were doing at the time and how this all came to you. Well, as you say, I was in a much different situation. I was in Canada on the Canadian scene. I was there at the convention when the decision was made to establish the seminary in Edmonton. Uh, I was at a convention in uh, Vancouver when uh, the word had gone out as to the selection of an individual at that time that was not Dr. Janzo, but then subsequently also hearing about Dr. Janzo having been selected. And um, I was, I was um, the executive uh, secretary of the Division of Theology of the Lutheran Council in Canada. And so one day I received a phone call from Dr. Janzo saying that he wanted to see me. And uh, so he uh, came to visit me in Winnipeg in my office and um, uh, started um, talking about this whole situation and talking about what I saw as the vision of the church in Canada. And um, then um, said, well now, um, I'd like you to react to different people that might perhaps be able to serve on the faculty of the seminary. And so he listed a number of them, and then he also listed myself. <laughs> and uh, I thought that was a rather interesting uh, way to do this, uh, since, uh, since it kind of warmed me up to the, the possibility of perhaps my name being introduced. And then I understand that, um, well, then it went through a fairly a lengthy process whereby um, uh, he said that he at some point, he, he said that he was prepared to recommend me for the faculty. In that first interview? In that, no, not in the first no. interview, but at a, at a later point. And then um, uh, it was a matter of clearing various hurdles, various groups. And um, so um, the word came back, well, it's about 95% <laughs> sure that you will be asked to do this. And uh, finally, the final word came, I mean, there had to be a decision made as to moving or not moving because of the house and this type of thing. Uh, the, um, the 
term of reference, I believe, was that I was supposed to start, would have started work on the 1st of July, and I believe uh, that the board met at the end of June. Oh. And, uh, and so at that point, I'd already burned my bridges behind me on the basis of Dr. Janzo feeling that uh, the Higher Education Committee in, in the LCC had approved it, the uh, Board of Higher Education in the United States had approved it, and so it was just that final step of going through the, the selection or the um, election process uh, by the board. And um, so that's how I came that's up. That's how you came up. Okay, so uh, in July then, uh, uh, 84, 83. The job, 84, 84 yes. Right. You were together uh, in this place. And maybe we should spend just a minute talking about the facility in which you met and prepared to do your work. And in the interest of time, we want to move along pretty good, but uh, each of you can just contribute to that uh, description as you wish. Well, let me just begin by saying that I, uh, I was approached in September. They invited me to come here and uh, discuss uh, the possibility. And in October, I went home and prayed about it with my uh, wife and my family. And uh, in uh, November, early November, had indicated that we had uh, So they invited both Francis and myself to come. It was over the Thanksgiving weekend when I had already announced my acceptance. And so uh, I then uh, appeared on the scene here on January the 6th of 1984. And at that particular point in time, although the task force for higher education and for the seminary training program and the Edmonton program had done simply a phenomenal job of an anticipating the blueprint, including the fiscal blueprint and the uh, academic blueprint, uh, and uh, also the physical facility blueprint. They had already identified the previous home, the president's home or manse here on the campus, which was available at that time as the original site for well, that seminar. That was the home of Dr. Schwerer, after he retired right. from the presidency, but continued as a professor, if I don't understand correctly. Well, but he lived in it as the president of the college, Concordia College, isn't that, uh, isn't that correct? But Fra uh, uh, Professor France, or President France, actually occupied it as president. I see. Yes. But okay. it was built for Dr. Schwerer yeah. 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 after he stepped down. After he stepped down. Yeah. Okay. Uh, however, when I appeared on the scene, it was still a, a family home. And uh, it, the arrangements, of course, were not suitable for a seminary operation. And so uh, we came here without any usable facility for the seminary, without any inkling who the faculty would be, without any idea who the students would be, and uh, with only some preliminary ideas where all of the funding would come from uh, as of uh, January 1984. So one of the first things that we had to do was to try to uh, design the remodeling of this very fine uh, building uh, into a facility which would occupy classrooms and offices and a student lounge and some, an area also for library services. Uh, and uh, the, the Church of Canada, of course, at that time had uh, already designated something like $60,000 for that uh, remodeling project. But we had to bring in uh, architectural assistance and work with them in order to design it. So, uh, incidentally, the first uh, additional staff member uh, that was added in addition to myself was, was the ex uh, administrative assistant or secretary to the president, who was Sigrid Albert. And I remember that our first session was held in the so-called lobby of that building, or perhaps it was the original living room of that building, sitting on the floor and talking about the procedures that needed to be followed as we were beginning to organize. Now, was that because there was no furniture yet? No furniture. Uh, just a no. bare, empty just building. Just a bare, empty building, right. <laughs> and uh, uh, so uh, then, of course, it didn't the, take you long to decide the remodeling, <laughs> remodeling uh, began and, and, of course, was completed then uh, in time for occupancy. Uh, uh, so all that was done before your July meeting? With these men? Uh, I'm not 
not sure whether or not it was completed. Was it already completed? I think, already pretty, well, in the UK? I think pretty well completed, okay. yes. Okay, okay that, that's the background of the building. Now, uh, each of you say something about how the building worked for you and for the students that you worked with. Well, first of all, we met, uh, we had a week-long faculty meeting in which we met up in one of the rooms and uh, it was just starting from scratch. Uh, uh, what are we doing to what are our, our, what is our program going to be like and all these various things. It was very helpful, I think, for Dr. Janja to have been president of an institution uh, because he uh, had a lot of checklists that he, that we felt that he was going through mentally, at least I felt, uh, and uh, so he had the ability to um, kind of uh, see what needed to be done. As far as the building serving the purpose for the students, there was certainly, uh, it was certainly fairly cramped, but at the same time, uh, there were, there was a lot of togetherness and uh, in my own case, uh, although it was, one well, always had to scoot around the desk to get into a position where you could talk to somebody without seeming to talk right across the desk, uh, there was room for two or three people to be in those offices. And um, I felt it worked out quite well. One had to uh, be uh, concerned about noise, particularly. One of the first things that we decided was that it would simply not do for us to smoke in the building for anybody to smoke in the building because it would simply carry throughout the entire building. And um, we, we had some interesting um, quick changes that had to be made uh, with the chapel, for example, where uh, the class would be meeting, then you had to take down the chairs from the class, or the tables from the classroom, put up the chairs for the chapel, and then immediately after the chapel, take down everything and get ready for the next uh, class. And so that was always rather interesting. Did the, stu did the students uh, develop something of a feeling of affection for that little building? I think that they did. Um, there was a problem, I think, initially for the group to come together in a cohesive way. The fact that it was a small building helped to bring that about, I believe. Uh, if, if, you're, uh, if there's nowhere to go, you have to talk to the people who are there. And, uh, so I think that the, the smallness of the building did have that advantage for us, that it tended to it help the cohesion community. of the, yeah. the community. This classroom incidentally that he's speaking about, which is probably located there, just where this chapel is located almost here, was exactly uh, across the hall from the president's office. And I'd like to have Dr. Ball indicate now, he's a very dynamic uh, lecturer, and he, he isn't known for talking extremely softly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you might make a comment about that as you did the other evening. Well, uh, in that uh, classroom is where we had the uh, first principles of Bible interpretation course, which we call uh, hermeneutics. And uh, so uh, whether Dr. Janzo liked it or not, he, he was a victim of my class and uh, I'm sure had to use extreme concentration in order to get his work done uh, while we were talking uh, just a few feet from him. Uh, and by the way, it wasn't only you, it was Sigrid also who had to uh, endure not only me, but uh, the other classes too. Uh, I, I, what I noticed though is uh, in those uh, early days, uh, a real coming together, a, 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 a looseness that enabled people to, shall I say, deal with the unexpected. Uh, I can remember for one reason or another uh, teaching my class out on the front lawn of the seminary. And uh, in the fall, having the two, three, or four people, they were small classes, uh, sit out there in the sun with me. Uh, the building uh, was small, as I said, and my office was right across from the student lounge. And do I remember right that Walter Dorn brought in some furniture that he got from somewhere so we could have some furniture for that student lounge? 
and, and in any case, uh, so I got in on a lot of their uh, uh, conversations. I should say I and uh, the little person I shared the office with, because there was a friendly mouse in my <laughs> office. Uh, I think he lived in my file folder under M. <laughs> but uh, he left me uh, for some time uh, little tokens of his awareness <laughs> that I might be aware of him and, and uh, so forth. He finally moved out, I must say. He finally, he finally moved out. But it was, uh, uh, it really was an exciting time. And uh, I remember uh, circumstances forced me to teach some of my first classes with very few uh, books accessible to me. Uh, except for uh, the Bibles and a few others. And strangely enough, that influenced me in my teaching in the years to come because it really meant that those first classes in biblical theology focused on uh, the Word, perhaps even more than I would have under normal, normal circumstances. So it really was... Uh, a blessing and a treat. Could, I wonder, uh, did you want no, to... I just want, I just want to say one thing. I, the, uh, the offices where the professors were located were in the basement, and the, those offices were quite cold in the wintertime. And uh, so I remember one, on one occasion, uh, Dr. Ed Lehman uh, showing up in the hall with a couple of heaters. <laughs> he just uh, very unobtrusively and he said, uh, I thought perhaps you could use these. <laughs> so they were set up and they were very useful. No, it was it was it was a makeshift, but you could do it. Yeah, you could do it. I'm it may have right in here yeah. to say there's a fifth person that needs to be mentioned uh, as part of this original staff. In addition to myself and Dr. Ball and Dr. China and Sigrid Albert, uh, by the blessing of God, because we have been uh, looking for somebody who could organize the library of services and the library of facilities. And uh, the question was whether we would be able to fund a full-time person, and it was decided we couldn't. So we needed to uh, try to search for some part-time individual. And somebody mentioned uh, to me, uh, gave me the suggestion uh, that I would call up the uh, headmaster or the superintendent of the Grant McEwen uh, uh, College. And he said, well, we, we just have somebody who graduated as a library technician and she has not found a placement. And he mentioned her name, and it was Carol Person at that time, now it's Mrs. Carol Farrar. Uh, and I called her up and invited her to come in. And uh, the bottom line is that uh, the Lord led her to accept uh, this position as library technician. She still is with the institution today. Incidentally, she was not a loser to begin with, but God also uh, led her in this process eventually to become a, a, a Lutheran Christian, and she has made a most distinguished contribution to the well-being of, uh, of the seminary. To get back to the beginning, as you were planning the curriculum and other things, would you care to, to express uh, some of the particulars of your vision. What were some of the special emphases and special qualities that you hope to uh, incorporate into this newborn institution and into the formation of the students here? Well, maybe I could comment a, a bit on that. And that is uh, when uh, Professor Janza led us through this process. He led us to see that uh, the tradition of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, and its educational system uh, had proved over the years to be uh, uh, sound and solid. And, and so that curriculum really formed the basis of what we did. We didn't just want to go out on our own. And yet there were certain things that became very distinctive about our uh, uh, curriculum. One of those was uh, the course that every student had to take, and still does, entitled uh, Lutheran Church Canada, which Dr. Trina had uh, 
has taught from the beginning. Uh, to give them an awareness that ministry in Canada was not the same as ministry in the United States. Uh, another thing that strikes me that we had from the beginning was uh, a course in mission and other cultures. And uh, that mission emphasis uh, uh, has uh, characterized the seminary from the beginning and has, as all of us know, grown over uh, the years and has been blessed with graduates who are now serving on the mission field as well as uh, uh, people from various cultures serving Lutheran Church Canada uh, right along us. I, I don't know if maybe something else should be said uh, about uh, Dr. Janzo, I remember your emphasis on the importance of preaching and uh, that our students uh, would be qualified and capable proclaimers of the gospel. Yeah, I would, if I would uh, try to summarize very briefly uh, my own uh, early vision for the contribution of the seminary would make to the Church of the Ministry here in Canada, uh, it would be that uh, uh, with the help of the Lord uh, and the talents that he had given to our faculty and staff, that we could uh, send out uh, pastors into the church who would really have uh, a, what we used to call in German, a Zelsorge Zell, uh, attitude, a really truly uh, shepherd type of attitude toward the ministry of their flocks in the congregation. And so the Lord led us to, as we were trying to put this into the choice of a theme for the seminary, led us to uh, the passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. Uh, and we summarized that in the word servants for Jesus' sake. And that, I think, uh, in my mind, was one of the great hopes and dreams that our pastors would really uh, go out with uh, not uh, an authoritarian attitude or uh, power feelings, uh, ego satisfactions, but rather uh, being true servants of God, servants of Jesus Christ, and ministers together with the members of their congregation for uh, the proclamation of the gospel and for the upbuilding of the faith within their congregation. Dr. Kreider, do you, do you feel that this, you know, slogans can just be empty words. Do you think that this theme has made a difference in the seminary? I'm convinced that it has. I think that the, um, the attitude that is expressed by that theme is something that uh, also helped to overcome the opposition to the seminary. And it also, I believe, um, helped to just... Uh, well, it helped in the acceptance of the seminary by the constituency. Uh, the, um, the feeling on the part of people who opposed the seminary's formation seems to me was that here we were going to get a super orthodox kind of seminary that was going to promote um, academics, Lutheran academics, and certainly we want to be academically respectable and, and so on. But uh, the whole thing of having a pastoral heart uh, that's something that I think had won over the constituency within a very short period of time. There were many people that were saying, we weren't in favor of the seminary, but we really feel that this is going to be a blessing of God. And I think that that really puts the finger on why it was a blessing. So this, this pastoral image, uh, the, the formation of that kind of pastor, uh, the hope of which was expressed in that thing, you felt was internalized by students and, and was appreciated by the church, if I understand. Right. right. And I think and I think that we tried as much as we could to also personify that ourselves uh, by um, the way we function with the students and uh, how we tried to move the students. The um, I think another thing that probably characterized I'm not sure how conscious this was, but it was certainly as we reflected back uh, uh, Dr. Ball and I on occasion with talk about this, and that's that I think that our emphasis was that we used an inductive approach to teaching rather than a deductive.
reductive approach, which more or less fit in with that image as well and with that spirit. Uh, so that uh, some students, for example, I remember in the early days, one student in particular said to me, uh, why don't you give me the answer? And I said, what I want you to do is to lead you to the answer so that when the question changes that you have the ability to come up with the correct answer then. And it seems to me that that's been the, the style by and large of our seminary teaching. And, uh, and this has also contributed to this rather more evangelical approach to ministry. I couldn't agree more with what has been said by uh, both of my colleagues. I would just uh, suggest one more ingredient that fit in there was the use uh, from the beginning of pastors who were qualified uh, from our church in the area who served as professors of practical theology. Uh, this brought into this whole uh, mix of service uh, for Jesus sake the ingredient of partners together uh, with the parish pastors and uh, helped our students to see uh, that what a parish pastor did and is doing was a central was a central ingredient uh, to the education uh, at the seminary so the use of these ad pastors as adjunct uh, teachers was not just to an um, emergency measure to meet a need for more teachers, but to enrich the, the uh, seminary experience with that pastoral element. Absol absolutely. And I would say they caught the spirit of this servant for Jesus' sake. And uh, uh, I can't say enough about the pastors in the Edmonton area what they did for our academic program and for the support of the seminary in those first years. This leads us back to something that Dr. Trina touched on, and we want to deal with this in a positive way. Uh, there was reference to opposition or resistance to the seminary, and also some things have already been said uh, about uh, how that was uh, overcome in part. Uh, I wonder if just a little bit of a very brief background statement as to, to uh, you mentioned one or more reasons why some people weren't enthusiastic about the seminary. Do you want to come any further on that, Doctor? Yes, I'd really like to do that, because I think this is pretty really crucial. Uh, I think, uh, and I wasn't present, uh, I guess Dr. Trine was, there, was present at the meetings at which this decision was made, but if I have the information correctly, it was not only not a unanimous decision, it was a very close decision by one or two votes to actually proceed with the establishment of a two-seminary system uh, in Canada, and then, of course, uh, to decide to have a second one here in Edmonton. And so there were uh, some very serious reservations in the minds of some of the pastors and uh, some of the congregations about the establishment of this seminary. And I, of course, became aware of that very quickly when I came here on the scene. Task Force and the Board of Regents had very wisely established three basic uh, goals for the new seminary. One was that it should be theologically sound, the second one that it should be academically respectable, and the third one that it should be fiscally viable. And as I made my uh, first contacts, particularly with uh, brethren in the ministry, those who were, uh, had these serious reservations uh, pointed out their conviction that number one, it would be impossible for us to attract a, a respectable faculty to this very tiny little beginning uh, seminary here in Edmonton. Secondly, they, uh, they were convinced that it, in no way could the Synod afford a seminary, could it become fiscally viable. And they were also worried about the ability, therefore, to attract quality students to this program. And uh, this is where, in my human judgment, uh, God entered into the picture. And I think perhaps the most uh, crucial uh, development in the, in the early days, in the spring and summer of 1984, was uh, God entering into the heart of these my two colleagues, Dr. Ronald Wall and Dr. Norman Trident, and leading them uh, to become members of 
this original faculty, uh, highly qualified, both of them with their PhDs, uh, very experienced and successful in their previous ministries, and entering here into the program and overnight impressing the students with the quality of the education that they were receiving, and of course going home to their local pastors and their families, sharing that with them. And it was very early that people began, the ones who had reservations saying, I think perhaps I've been uh, too pessimistic about this. And uh, so I, I really have to uh, thank the Lord for uh, the, the fact that he sent these his servants to, uh, to be this uh, original faculty at uh, the seminary. Is there any of you have any sense that uh, experience with seminary students in the congregation changed the opinions of some? I would say that that was a very uh, important factor as well, the fact that they did field work in the congregations. Um, in a couple of instances, the fact that these students were coming from these congregations had something to do with it as well. That the students decided that this is where they want to go for their seminary education, and then the pastor was confronted with um, uh, just the fact of uh, these are my my students, and um, that uh, helped to uh, to swing it for some people. Also, the fact that these pastors were asked to lead in worship, uh, I believe their their contact. There were a couple of instances in which. We knew of pastors who had very serious reservations, and um, the, the big step was usually when they would accept the invitation to come and have chapel. That seemed to be the turning point for a number of people at any rate. They were involved as part of it. <laughs> That's right. And as Dr. Bowman, the invitations, uh, I would say, uh, we purposely sent out, uh, not discriminating against anybody but assuming no matter what their view had been toward the seminary, uh, that now the seminary was here, we just anticipated that uh, uh, as partners in the ministry, they would join us in the uh, great calling of the school. Uh, just briefly, how would you, jumping ahead to this 10th year, how would you characterize the attitude of the constituency toward the seminary? Well, I guess I would say that it has uh, been very positive and supportive uh, all the way along. Uh, I have a sense, and I hope it is true, uh, because we've uh, tried to set this forth, that we're very much interested in comments about the seminary, whether they're positive or negative, and we want to... Uh, deal with them, and uh, uh, at least from my experience, uh, I think the pastors uh, operate uh, this way. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind that there, like everything else, there was a honeymoon period when we could perhaps hardly uh, do anything wrong once it was accepted. Uh, if I could share a little bit, one of the truly gratifying things was the uh, almost a 180 degree turnaround that happened in the early years. Uh, from the time, there, there was a time in which the uh, district expressed uh, its view through a vote uh, as to uh, how well it uh, was willing to support uh, the uh, start of the seminary. And I'm talking about the uh, both of the two western districts and uh, the votes were, uh, at that point in time, before the seminary had been established, uh, very tentative in terms of that support. Uh, I think it was in the second year after the establishment of the seminary, overtures again came to both of these districts uh, that were somewhat pessimistic. And in both cases, and I would say particularly Manitoba, Saskatchewan district, where an even larger percentage of reservations had been present, that in both of those cases, after a couple of years already, those uh, suggestions to be negative were 
were voted down almost unanimously. I think perhaps there was one, one vote that continued to have reservation, and that was certainly a marvelous signal that the church uh, had, once the decision had been made, once the seminary had been organized, once they had actually experienced the, the wonderful contribution that was being made, that in true churchman style, they said, well, God has made the decision, and God is blessing the decision, and now we are going to uh, wholeheartedly support that decision. I'd just like to comment about uh, Dr. Janzo gave high marks to Dr. Wall and myself for helping to turn it around. I think that he uh, certainly made a, a major contribution in just simply the meetings that he was able to attend, uh, district board meetings. I was not present at any of them, but I, I, hear, I heard stories about uh, the fact that uh, when he would arrive, uh, people would um, perhaps be rather uh, bristly and, and this type of thing, and within a matter of a short period of time uh, in uh, his identifying uh, his roots in the district, uh, all these connections uh, with uh, C.C. Janzo and with uh, Wigner, uh, this, this helped to, to mellow people and that uh, people began to see the, the human side of the whole thing, of the, the whole issue, and that if a man like Dr. Janzo was for it, then uh, uh, they should at least be listening. So I think that that had a lot to do with it. Along that same vein, I, I remember that in those early days, uh, you and Fran took a trip, didn't you? Because you said you wanted to get to know the people and the churches. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, for a couple of weeks, stayed with a lot of families and people, and uh, really had a chance to uh, share what the seminary was all about. We really spent an entire month uh, in the summertime, and we set up uh, uh, meetings in every circuit of the two western districts, and the people were invited to come together to those meetings. I think that's what you that's what I'm thinking. Right. As we draw near the end of the available time for this interview, I would like just to ask each of you to uh, contribute some observations or comments of any kind that you feel would, would help to fill out the picture that we sketched here so briefly. You look like you're ready to say something, Dr. Franklin. Well, the, um, I'm sure that there is much that could be said uh, about the whole situation. As I reflect on my own situation, I, I mentioned that Dr. Janzo talked to me when I was working with the Lutheran Council in Canada. And um, uh, I suspect that there were people uh, who, who were saying, well, uh, this person is an inter-Lutheran person. Do we want this kind of person at the seminary? And um, uh, the, I guess what I have felt is that um, coming to the seminary, has enabled me to, um, I think, function with integrity uh, in, in a way that um, was very important to me. Uh, my interaction with uh, my colleagues uh, has um, been very positive, and I, I trust that um, any, any reservations that people had about me <laughs> uh, were, were shown to be ill-founded. But um, at any rate, Perhaps, as I look back, also the fact that I was involved in an inter-Lutheran basis uh, may have helped those who were more minded toward inter-Lutheran directions uh, to give the seminary a second look. I'm hoping that that was part of it, and that's probably kind of one of those, uh, uh, those points of humor that God has, and that he shows sometimes that uh, the things that may seem as though they are negatives, uh, also have a positive edge to them. And I'm not patting myself on the back at all in, in regard to this, I'm just simply saying that that was the situation, and uh, perhaps Dr. Jones knows better than that. And I've used it in some way. In a sense, you answered the question that I didn't ask, which is a very important question, and maybe the others would. What, what does it mean to you personally and professionally to have been part of this venture from the beginning. Would you, we'll save you for last, Dr. Butler. Well, I think that uh, one 
definitely thinks of God's miraculous work in our own history and in our own lives and that he makes what he wills come to pass and what he wills is that his word uh, will not return void and uh, I, I just must say in all of this uh, one of the things that in, has impressed me more than anything else and uh, it has to do with Dr. Jansel but it also has to do with you is that as we work together, both of you put the church ahead of everything else. That is, we worked as friends and colleagues, but decisions were made for the sake of the gospel and for the sake of Lutheran Church Camp. Uh, and sometimes uh, Dr. Janzo, as you, had to say tough things to us as well as good things. But they were all within the context of uh, God working in the church. And that was for me most beautiful. Dr. Jackson, you want to finish this? I'll, make, I'll make some personal observations here. And, uh, for me, I have to say simply that this was the capstone of uh, my uh, ministry. I had, uh, by the grace of God, uh, been privileged to, to serve in uh, very exciting ministries along the way. I had parish ministries in northern Minnesota and a parish ministry in southern Illinois. And uh, by the workings of God, in kind of a strange way, I had the opportunity to be a district president there in southern Illinois for a number of years. And again, by a rather uh, strange uh, combination of circumstances, uh, I was called into the faculty at Concordia College in Seward uh, and then was elected to be the president and had the opportunity to serve there in what at that point in time, uh, to the surprise of many people, had become the largest uh, synodical college in the synodical system. I think we had about 15 colleges at that point in time in a rural, small rural community uh, with tremendous growth that we had the opportunity uh, to uh, be in charge of the building of seven major building projects, uh, almost half of the buildings that are on the campus during that period of time from 1963 to 1977. Uh, so it was very exciting uh, and it was uh, a very uh, large, complex uh, educational challenge that we had there. Uh, and then to move from that uh, into the organization of a new educational institution from scratch and uh, not being able to at first delegate uh, to this dean or that dean or this uh, director of a program uh, but having at least for the first uh, four months to try to work through all of these nuts and bolts <laughs> issues all by myself until fortunately I had the brilliant uh, 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 association with these two gentlemen to, to help uh, really put it all together into an operative uh, seminary uh, institution. Uh, tremendously exciting. Uh, when you recall that I had been at the point of uh, retirement at the age of 65 and I had this, uh, this final uh, privilege then of uh, serving the Lord and the church uh, in helping to found this seminary. Just a fantastic, because I had really grown up uh, with stories about the, the mission expansion and the growth of the church in Canada. My father began his ministry here in Alberta. My uncle Carl began his ministry in Alberta. My father moved back to the States. My uncle Carl continued to stay here and, and spent the rest of his ministry right here in, in these two western districts. My mother's brother, another uncle, uh, was called to Canada right out of the seminary in the Manitoba, Saskatchewan district uh, and uh, was very prominent in the development of the church program there in that district. It was uh, Pastor Paul Wiener. Uh, and so I had heard about it. We, I was born and raised in 
Ada, Minnesota, and I was called to establish uh, a new seminary in the, at the kind of climax of my life on Ada Boulevard <laughs> in Edmonton, Alberta. So I can only say, as I look at that banner over there, that truly expresses a, a summary of my uh, feelings. To, uh, Rejoice, give thanks, and sing. Praise God for this marvelous blessing of having this uh, opportunity to become the founding president of the Cody Luther Center. On that note, we close.